afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Real Bravo Fine Art Gallery. My name is Kerry Jagger Dustin. I'm your current Arts Council Board President. This is the first in our Art Talks and Lecture Series for 2023, so look for that on the schedule. Thank you to Eduardo and the gallery staff today. Our guest today lived in New York for 11 years. His artistry is self-taught, on the job. He moved here in 2020. He traded the concrete towers and jungle of the city for our desert. We're glad he did. Please welcome artist Chris Craig. It's going to sound like he had a microphone. I, tell me if I'm not speaking loud enough, but I'll, I'll try. Um, I grew up in uh, Hayward, California. I was a young man in the Bay Area. And one of the questions everybody asks is, how did I get started painting billboards? And uh, it's a weird thing to do for a career, but it just, it didn't fall into my lap, but it's something that I just had been, uh, but anyway, so I, I'd been drawn since I was a little kid, and I started doing large art on my fence in my backyard. And I would find white paint, because that was the only color you could find back then, and I would do these different designs and silhouettes and shapes, and this is, you know, I'm 12, 14 years old doing this. But I had a knack for it. And uh, started working for a guy named Fred Daly. He was, his name was The Brush. It was such a great name. I brought, but every hand letter to the truck door, he painted this perfect little brush with a drop of paint coming off it. And I was like, wow, I want to do that someday. That is so cool. So I started helping him, sweeping the shop and doing different things. And he gave me some paint. So I would go off and I would go do my own truck doors and my own lettering jobs on the side. He didn't seem to mind. You know, I was pretty primitive, but I was a lot cheaper than him, too. So. Uh, so I kept doing that, but the school I went to, it was a Catholic school and it had no art program. You could learn to be a draftsman, you know, you, there's a lot of things you could do, but they had no art program, so I didn't take art classes. I got a heck of an education, but, uh, you know, I never really learned that in school. So after I graduated, I didn't have really have the grades, I wasn't going to go to college, I started driving a lumber truck, which I had kind of done part-time through high school, and uh, I got in the te Teamsters Union, which was, I mean, that was fabulous if you get in the Teamsters Union. And this is 1973 in Hayward, California. So I started driving a truck for Jackson Street Lumber, and he would just go all over the Bay Area. That's back when the Bay Area was really, it was the place to be. It was a magical place. New this, new that. It was really a fun place. And, so I'm driving down the road one day in Oakland on High Street, and I see this warehouse. And I couldn't believe it. I looked out the corner of my eye, and I had to stop. The roll-up door was open for the first time, and I'd driven by this place 10, 15 times. It was full of billboards being hand-painted. And they were all kind of at an angle, going back. There must have been 15 boards, 16, and then a, a, a shop in the back. And they were part of the rotate program. They were 14 by 48 billboards that got painted in this studio and then taken apart, put on trucks, and then taken all over the Bay Area and hung on all these billboards all over town. And I, I just couldn't believe my eyes. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this place and I'm seeing uh, the black velvet girl. It looks like a, a Snoopy MetLife billboard. Uh, Winston cigarette ads just stacked up, ready to go out in the corner. I said, oh, God, I gotta get a job here. This is this is my this is me. This is my calling, you know. And um, so I met with the fellow named Bud Schultz, and this is Bud Schultz. He said, "Well, kid, some guys retire next week, and we're gonna need someone. But we don't know what you can do, you know." <laughs> so I said, "Well, I'm gonna go home. I got all my little drawings. I hadn't done much stuff with color. I brought them back and showed him my real simple sketches that I had done up to that point." And he goes. Well, we'll give you a try. <laughs> and if you've got to try, then you were good. So he gave me the big, he started me out with the biggest brush in the whole shop right away, which was the broom to sweep the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so he started sweeping the floor, and then pretty soon he had me coating out these boards, like ad nauseum for days and weeks and months. I'm just coating out these billboards, 
because it was job security. The old ad had come in, it was a beautiful paint job. And said, you cook that one out, kid, you know? And you just cooked this 14 by 48 out of 674 square feet. And, you're, and here's this beautiful artwork that in 20 minutes it's gone. And I'm thinking, wow, this is perfect. This is me, I mean, this is what I wanna do. So he said, we'll start you, it's a five year apprenticeship to be a, a, a billboard painter. And at the time, it was Local 510, and it was the Sign Painters and Allied Trades. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everything was union in the Bay Area. If you wanted to work on any factory, any plant, you had to have a union card. If you went in to letter up the front of the door or anything. So he, uh, we just kept, uh, anyway, so I, I, I started my program to become a, a, a union sign painter. And I think I did the five-year program in about two and a half or three. And the ultimate test was to be able to, you worked your way up. First thing you did was coat out, and then you got to maybe paint a cigarette box, and then you got to do a liquor bo a bottle, which was quite complicated, you know, a lot of blends and this and that. And the ultimate test was to paint a woman's face. And they gave me a face to paint. It was okay, but it looked good from about 400 feet and 70 miles an hour. <laughs> So I pulled it off, he gave me my journey, journeyman card. And, you know, I worked there another year or so, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm still a young guy. I'm gonna go, go to LA and see if I can go find a job down there. So I moved my whole operation to Los Angeles, thinking, oh, I'm a great, I got my journeyman card. I can go work anywhere now. I show up in LA and they looked at it and laughed at me. They, they said, man, we don't need you. So I just couldn't get a job painting billboards, but I met a guy named Terry Schoenhaven, who was just a, probably one of the top muralists. In fact, he was doing murals when nobody was doing murals in Los Angeles, California. This is in the 70s. But he was doing these incredible jobs, all with acrylic paint, and he hired me to, to help him be his right-hand man, and it was, it was wonderful. Uh, I did that for about a year, and then he got slow, and then I met this girl, and she moved to New York, so I chased her to New York, and said, well, I should be able to get a job painting billboards in New York, right? <laughs> Plus, I had this huge apartment to live in while I was there, because she, her brother and her had bought this place years ago. So sure enough, I went to the Foster and Kleiser place in New York City, which was the big advertising, big billboard company nationwide. They're the company I worked for in Oakland. And they said, sure, when can you start? Uh -oh. I said, this afternoon, I'm kind of broke. <laughs> and uh, so I started painting billboards for them, and of course in the, in the shop or studio first, and they said, well, this is a big, strong, strapping kid, we're sending him out, you know. And uh, so it was just such a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to uh, to do these jobs all over New York City. I never did a New York, I never did a Times Square billboard, but I did 59th Street, up and down the West Side Highway, and, you know, all over the city. And my helper was a guy named Frank Raziopi. He was, I thought he was old back then, but he was probably maybe in his late 50s. <laughs> but everybody knew Frank. He had the keys to every rooftop that we needed to get on. Yeah. He knew the super. He knew everybody. He'd say, don't worry about it, kid. We'll get you on the roof. It's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so he'd get us up there, and we'd rig these giant boards on the top of these rooftops, coat them out, kill this beautiful old ad, and then we had to proceed to paint this giant picture on it. But the real fun part about it for me was once I reported it to the shop, and I'd mix my colors, and then I, you know, we had 30 guys working in the shop, and I was a, I was a pictorial artist at that time. That was the designation, be a pictorial artist. They get everything out there, you know. After I mix my colors and all that, I'd ride my bicycle to the job, <laughs> and I do that for sometimes a week or two, however long the job took to paint, you know. So that was, that was a real fun part of, of the whole thing. And I don't know, should we show some slides in Pardo, or do you think we should? Yeah. I could maybe show you some slides. This is Bud Schultz, he gave me my chance. He's still alive, I talked to him a couple of months ago. He's still, uh, he's still kicking. 
Uh, we talk, we have some good laughs all the, at the time when we talk about uh, how he gave me an opportunity. <coughs> he, uh, he got, uh, his father was in the billboard business. It was a lot of uh, nepotism. Uh, a lot of the kids that went into it weren't that good. Their fathers were good, but the kid wasn't any good. And so I remember dealing with that in New York City especially. And, and a little side note, do you think New York City had the best billboard painters on the planet? Come to find out, they were in San Francisco, California, where I worked. It was really, that was really a fun thing to find out. They were the best. It was a real disappointment when I got to New York. These guys couldn't even mix colors. I'm mixing colors for all these journeymen. I walked in the paint room one time and there was this five gallon bucket of this weird color in the back. And I asked him, what the heck is that? And he said, well, we sent Louie out. We'd had, he tried to match his color and he kept having to add more color and add more color. <laughs> He was trying to mix a quart. By the time he was done, he had a five-gallon bucket of paint. <laughs> so anyway, let's show the next one, Eduardo. This is all hand-painted. This is 3M Media. Actually, we're jumping ahead a little bit, but this is with no airbrush. We did like 30 of these, a couple on, on location, but it's all hand-painted with brushes. There's no airbrush in this thing at all. It's just... You know, it's just a huge amount of effort. But by the end, we were cranking like one, one of these out every two days. And that's a 14 by 48 foot. Of course, we were painting for distance, too. I mean, you can get away with a lot uh, when you're painting for people going 70 miles an hour down the interstate highway. So what's the next one? Hey, Chris. Yeah. Can you move the volume of your stuff yeah. back Sorry. a little bit? So we'll be able these, this is being painted on location. I think this was, I'm skipping ahead again, but we'll just go with it. This is in Utah, and this was one of my helpers. I think that might be me. We would put a swing stage on all these and get up there, coat it out, get up there, and we would transfer the image and just paint it right on site. That was a 1448. What's the next one? Edward? This was a very unique moment in history. This was in... Uh, outside of um, uh, Rock Springs, Wyoming. I don't know if you can read what the ad is. This was one of my truly best helpers I ever had, Billy Sutton, aside from my son. He's not here to him. Uh, we actually had a side-by-side -side billboard and we were painting the other side at the same time. So we showed up, we, we, were, we were like, oh, we're making bank on this. We were able to paint three boards in one day. So that was, that was a money job there. So what's the next one, Eduardo? This is a fun map. This is New York City. That's the Bruckner Expressway heading up through the Bronx towards Manhattan. And the, when I, the first time I painted this, there was nothing on this. This was a virgin wall. The windows were still clear to the outside and everything. The salesman had sold this job, and that's what you could do in New York. I mean, everything is... It's, I know, it's available. Yeah. So we coated this thing out, and it was so sad. They were making suitcases in there. We're coating out all the windows, and these ladies are looking through the windows as they're being coated out. <laughs> it's like, sorry, you know. We're just showing up painting this thing. But this cutout alone, uh, I don't know if you can tell, but this is like 15 feet on top of the building, just the cutouts. We built those and engineered them to sit on top. And, you know, it, we ended up doing that two more times uh, after that while I still worked at, uh, for Foster Kleiser. So what's the next one, Eduardo? This was fun. This was 1984. If anyone's wondering what year that Thunderbird is, it's an 84. And uh, just the wheel alone was like six feet tall on that thing. That was up on the Upper West Side Highway. And it was, you know, this was before OSHA and safety belts. I had a belt on, of course, it's, a, it's around your waist. And the worst thing you could ever happen is if you fall off, it'll just break your back. Oh, God. That's not funny. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but to get from one stage to the other, you kind of had to get it swinging to step over to that one because we didn't have enough swing stages to make the full distance. So we just kind of <laughs> give it a swing and then you would just step over to the next one. <laughs> So 
So this was at the 59th Street Bridge. I don't know, I think that's Pete Fennell. He was a famous, yeah. uh, what is that, a trombone? Yeah. Uh, famous player, player. Anyway, so we, we did this quite often. But I, I like this shot because it shows the, the, the apparatus. This was all, these swing stages, it has a pulley here, and you're pulling yourself up and down to, to do the job the whole time. And this is called hemp rope. It was the best. Sissel was better, but hemp was really good too. Sissel you, gave you more splinters. Hemp was a little softer on your hands. When did you start using the airbrush? No airbrush. Oh, okay. Never, no, 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 never used airbrush. These are all, all these blends and everything are all just done with brushes. Yeah. So. All right, what's the next one? Oh my God. Ah, oh, my God. Yes. We probably painted a hundred of these. <laughs> and, and not all of them, but a lot of them. In the early days, the little dog's head went up and down and her panties went up and down. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a fun one. And that, that uh, uh, this was in the Foster and Pleasure yard. I remember painting this. And this was... The, they're 1448, but this had the spectacular molding around it, they called, called that. So that, that was a real fun one. And every apprentice got to paint that. So what's the next one? This is, uh, this is Dwight Gooden. That's 14th Street, New York City. And uh, he was Rookie of the Year that year. And the when I, when I did that job, I was real thrifty and I showed up, I hardly had any paint. And my, my helper, Billy, says, where's all the paint? You're never gonna be able to paint this thing. I said, that's all I need. Anyway, I did it, I pulled it off, I finished it, but the, the weird thing about this job is we did use suspended uh, scaffolding with electric motors because it was over 250 feet down to here. <laughs> Uh, but when the wind started blowing, you're, there was nothing to anchor onto here, so the scaffolding would slide way out the 14th Street, and you're looking right down, you can see Brooklyn on the other side, it's like, oh my God, this is, this is petrifying. I'm just holding onto the handline like that. And then the wind had died down, and it slid back into place. So here we are, 90 miles from Green River, Wyoming. <laughs> this is a big transition when I moved from Denver to, to Ever I mean from New York City to Denver and slash Evergreen, Colorado. Um, my wife and I didn't want to raise kids in New York. We found out she was pregnant. We <coughs> found a way to move from New York to Denver and so we did it. And I, I got to Denver broke. Um, I remember driving up and down Colfax Avenue and Broadway, and just to make money, I was repainting used car lot signs. And, but I finally got on with the local billboard shop, and, and uh, within about a year, I was running the shop. And, uh, we had, I think at the, our zenith, we had 10 employees, and we were painting signs all the way down from Casper, Wyoming, all the way down to Trinidad, Colorado, and from Evanston all the way out to, um, let's see, I think we made to Kearney, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these billboards all along Interstate 80 or Interstate 25, and they were all hand-painted. <laughs> they were all hand-done. The technology, that we were the technology. We were just like a real slow printing press. <laughs> <laughs> So then, well, this is out of context, but I'll tell you why this is in here. In uh, 2021, I had an art show up in Evergreen at the Center Gallery in Evergreen, Center for the Arts Evergreen, and I painted one of those same billboards inside the gallery. I built a wall and painted. I always wanted to do a billboard inside. <laughs> so I painted that exact same thing. I put the swing stage on it and the whole nine yards. So that's why that's here. But anyway, what's the next one? This was a fun program. Okay, so this is what happened. In 1995, I had been painting all of these billboards all over Colorado and Nebraska and Wyoming. And the boss came to me from the 3M and he said, well, we got technology now. We don't need you guys anymore. We're going to be stretch vinyls on all these billboards. 
said, oh, okay, really? Okay, we'll figure this out, are you sure? And he goes, yep, yeah, we got the technology worked out. And Art Kluge years ago came to the shop. He owned Foster and Kleiser. He told us the same thing back in 1982, and nobody believed him. It finally had gotten there. We finally got to the point where nothing got hand-painted anymore. Uh, my crew was sending guys out, and we were stretching these giant vinyl tarps on all these billboard signs. <laughs> And uh, I said, well, this, I'm, you know, I, I don't want to do this anymore. And it was always windy. And you go up there and try to walk, stretch a vinyl in Wyoming. It was like trying to sail a ship. <laughs> so I kind of got out of that. And I started a company called Evergreen Signs, the local sign shop. And one thing led to another. And I tried to do murals and stuff. But the Denver Art Museum, they were my godsend. They commissioned me to do, oh, maybe 18 or 20 reproductions from their private collection. Wow. And if you were a patron, I would paint that for you on canvas. And it looked just like the original, because they let gave me access to the originals. And I was able to reproduce it. And then they made a ton of money selling it to these patrons, because they own the rights to it. What we're looking at here is a piece that actually got painted on a wall in downtown Denver to help promote the Denver Art Museum. And that's called the, uh, the Potato Gatherers by Auguste Renoir. And every time I went to paint these, I didn't really need to, but I said, well, I need to see the original. <laughs> <laughs> and they gave me the white gloves, and I got to go right, like, right up to here and look at it. You know? and they, were just, they have a fabulous collection, but anyway, that's how this got done. What's the next one in front of This is in. Denver, Colorado. This was, uh, that's 200 feet tall. It's called the Free Climber. Uh, it's a woman, sort of, that's a, a way you can climb up these cracks. It's quite popular in Colorado and Utah. This guy had this building, and he just had a bunch of old lawyers and a bunch of old farts in this building, and when somebody would retire, they, they you know, they, they couldn't fill the space. So he renovated the whole building, contacted me, said, what should we put on the side? I said, I don't know. I mean, it should be something athletic, something sports oriented. And so this is what we came up with. And this was the first big job my son helped me on. Will Creek, he just helped me do the, the hummingbird. Uh, he loved, he helped me a lot when he was a kid, but you know, he was a kid and he wasn't that focused. So he helped me on this and he got the bug. He got it bad after working on this with me. It's 200 feet, we had an electric stage on it. And there's like, I don't know, there's like 12, 20 colors in this blend because it transitions from this brilliant blue all the way down to, uh, you can't really tell in this photograph, but a real bright sunset down here. And he was really amazed about the process of doing a blend mechanically, no airbrush. Uh, <laughs> and these are all tricks that I had learned in San Francisco and New York, how to break these colors down and how to make these blends so that you can so they're undetectable. It's called a mechanical blend as, as opposed to a visual blend. Mm -hmm. And he just loved the whole process. So I said, he said, you know, I want to do this. I said, well, let me, let me see if I can hook you up with, with a guy in New York City who runs a company called Colossal Media. They have like 100 boards there, and they're all hand-painted. Well, Will went there and worked for two years, and when he got back, he knew, he knew it all. In fact, he was telling me how to paint. <laughs> he goes, well, that's not how we do it in New York. <laughs> I said, well, that's not how I did it in New York, but it's how I'm doing it here, you know? <laughs> so he just really got it, and he's really good. He's running altitude murals in Denver now and uh, doing a really good job. He's, he's good. So what's the next one? This, this is a fun one. These are called spandrel walls. This was a dreadful parking garage in Denver. And this was our solution. We hired a, an artist to come up with the image. And uh, Will and I hand painted this on the spandrels in February. It was cold. And, this, uh, and these are screens. We didn't paint the screens. We actually had these printed by a, uh, uh, a printer. And, and it was amazing how close, I say how close he was to my colors, but I'm amazed how close I was to his. Because we were both working off the same palette. 
and we're able to come up with, with, uh, with that. And that's a big piece. It's a huge, huge parking garage. <laughs> this was a fun one, and what was fun about it was my son designed it. He, he came up with the idea. I, I said, well, that's going to work because it was just a dreadful white wall. It's on Quebec Street out by the Denver International Airport. It looked terrible. And uh, the, the owner said, how can we jazz this thing up? And that Q was before Q and on. I won't give it. <laughs> that's Quebec Street. So this is what we came up with. And here again, all the glands, and just sort of breaking up this really odd shape. And that was about 180 feet and really tricky to rig because of those angles on the sides. We really had to brainstorm about how to do that. And if you have any questions while we're going along, I mean, I'm, we, can, we can answer questions. Did you have to rig it yourself? Did you have your own stuff? Or did you uh, the spider came in the first time and rigged the first swing. And then after that, we moved all the equipment ourselves. My son got his riggers license when he was in New York City. They had to pass a, a math test of all things. I would, I would not be able to do that. But he knows all the formulas for the counterweights and all that stuff. So yes and no. And normally we do rig our own stuff. We go down and I don't own a lot of this stuff, but I have some of it. And uh, but we know we know the drill. You know the hardest part usually is getting the electrical. Tap, tapping into the 220 of the building. You always have to. That's the, the big process. So what's the next one, Edward? This was a really fun one. Uh, this was a famous watercolor artist named Willie Matthews that lives in Denver. And I painted that on the side of his art gallery. Um, and you could see the housing market and the economy was sizzling back then. <laughs> <laughs> February 20 something, 1999. So that's what was going on. The economy was sizzling. <laughs> it's still there. The mural is still there. Um, it's totally faded away. It's, it's a true ghost sign. You can't hardly see it. And, and I offered to repaint it. But since then, this is the weirdest story. There, the guy who owned the building put a marijuana dispensary in there. The first one in Colorado, he got there, he got the first dispensary, and he proceeded to put a joint in the cowboy's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and that pissed the artist off so much. He was like, screw you. You're, you know, I own the rights to that. If you touch it, I'm going to sue you. <laughs> <laughs> So that's why years later it's still still it's just fading away. And the name of the painting was called a fine old Martin. Um, and it was staged. I remember the the, uh, the writer from the Denver Post said, "Can you get the scaffold to go at the same angle as the neck of the guitar?" And I said, "Okay." Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, what's the next one? Oh, this is just a real fun bang out job. I just love the energy. Uh, this is, I think, Rage Against the Machine or something. It has to start somewhere. It has to start sometime. What better place than here? What better, what better place than now? Chris, yeah. when you've got such a huge image, like that one on that building when you're painting out the windows, how do you project the starting image onto there? How do you get, how do you pick place? That's a good What's question. the process of that? What's the next one? Maybe we can. We did a lot of these, but we never took photographs of them. <laughs> it's like, okay, we got that one done. <laughs> that is the weird. I'll tell you in a minute, but that is the weirdest thing to paint. And to tr like, like you said, how do you transfer that image to paint that logo on that thing? Well, we make paper patterns in my studio, and. Um, it's, I don't know who invented it, but uh, Michelangelo used it, a lot of artists used it back in the day. But what they would do is, they would draw on paper, whatever paper was in 1500. Whatever, you know, Michelangelo, let's say he would draw this beautiful image. Well, his apprentice would come behind him with a little steel stylus and poke little holes along all the color breaks. 
And then, of course, they'd take that out to wherever, let's say the Sistine Chapel, and they would hold that up there in position and hit it with a bag of charcoal, and the charcoal would transfer through those microscopic holes and leave you an outline. So that's your roadmap. And we use the same process here. Um, and we just throw all that paper away and we're done. So what's the next one, Edward? That's Shannon Sharp. That's a fun one. Uh, that's in the studio. And of course, you know, we were just such wall dogs. We just put a swing stage up on the billboard and that's how we painted it. This was a fun project. This is in Golden, Colorado. I've done this three times now. Mm -hmm. I did it in the 90s. It's a south-facing wall. It fades. The people from the city say, can you repaint it? I repaint it. It fades. That's job security. <laughs> <laughs> and I made the mistake this time of using a very high-end clear UV sealant, so I, uh, I worked myself right out of a job. <laughs> but this was just part of it. The whole piece was 100 feet long, but it's, it's sort of a diorama of old golden Colorado. This was just one panel of it. So what's the next one? <laughs> this is called the Breakable Bear. Um, if, I wish you could zoom in on it. There's detail on the detail. I didn't design this. It was designed by a guy named Kevin Sloan. And uh, if you notice, if you looked at this close up, it's a very rough brick wall. And you can't even tell. I mean, it's face brick, but there's, I mean, it's, it's rough. And um, when you get distance on this thing, it just disappears. Um, but it's a beautiful image. Um, People really enjoy looking at it. It's on Colorado Boulevard at night. It's an 85 foot square. Uh, it took Will and I a month to paint, and uh, it'll just live on forever now. It has a perfect angle, so it doesn't get a lot of sun refraction on it, so I think it'll probably be good for another 30 years. This is in New York City. I go back there periodically and paint for a company called Colossal Media. And this was one of the uh, campaigns that we did. Um, I, I threw this in because it's just, everything Everything is really loose close up. You're painting for distance. I mean, this almost looked like cornflakes when I was painting close up. And, you know, the further you get, your eye starts blending all these colors and then it becomes what it's supposed to be. All of this is just bam, bam, bam with a brush. And, you know, all these textures on here, it, it, you know, it's it's all just brush strokes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. through the consequences, New Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it. <laughs> That's my wife, Sue. Uh, I, uh, Rooster had just opened the Giddy Up. Of course, there was no sign there, and we met. He was a little skeptical, and I said, you need a sign. <laughs> she goes, well, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a sign painter. I got, you know, I, I, got, I got my chops. I'll design something. If you like it, I'll paint it on the side of your restaurant there. So she looked at it, and then the very next day it was done. She goes, how'd you do that so fast? <laughs> I said, well, that's, you know, we're sign painters. That's what we do. Um, so that was the first thing I had done here, and it was a wonderful opportunity to, to do that. And she gave me the chance and uh, done a few since. What's the next one, Edward? This, I don't know if you guys have been, have you been to Uray? Uray? Yes. Uh, Brett Tansy has a peach orchard out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was this derelict tank that was just sitting on the property that he thought would look good embellished. He said, do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're getting 12 foot tall peaches or 8 foot tall peaches. <laughs> <laughs> and it was exactly 100 foot all the way around that thing. And it's lovely. I clear coated that too, so that'll last a good long time. All right, what's the next one? Uh, yeah, this is an alley behind the drugstore. That's Deb Holland. She, uh, she hasn't seen, she might have seen this. 
This is on the uh, Austin Arts Center. Uh, we're threatening to do the other side, but things keep getting in the way and get busy doing other stuff, but we will get to it at some point. Um, I put a bunch of words in the sky, all these positive messages. You can't see them too. Is the next one here? I love this because she's looking into the, into the uh, storm there. Um, but that was a nice portrait of her. So what's the next one? Oh, this, this was a lousy photo. This ended up down at the river bend. Uh, he had that buried in one of his little places there. But it was just showing you the randomness. When you get away from it in real life, it looks pretty good. So what's the next one? Uh, the salt of the earth. Uh, John Henry is part owner of the uh, of a, a theater there, and um, he said, "Why don't we come up with something on those panels on the side?" And I kind of brainstormed. I, I did a little research. I, I googled movies made in New Mexico, and sure enough, this one popped up. And it's quite controversial. It was never even shown in theaters. Uh, it's on YouTube now, but it, back in the day, if you showed this, you would be blackballed because it was during that whole McCarthy era, mm -hmm. McCarthyism thing. There was a lot of politics in the movie business at the time. She was an illegal immigrant from Mexico, and they were filming over in Sierra County on the way to uh, uh, Silver City. And they just shut the operation down. They, they came in and shut the movie down. They actually, this movie director, maybe someone knows the story better than me, they had to go to Mexico to do the final scenes with her. So it never got shown. Now since then, John has shown it at the theater, which has been nice. So there's a real history about the, politi the, uh, the political part of this and the union thing because they were striking against the, the mine that was over by Central City. So anyway, I, it was a lovely black and white image that I had to paint there. And more to come. I, we're going to do a few more panels over there. So what's the next one? Oh, yes. This is on the side of the Center Gallery of Fine Art at the intersection of Foch and Maine. And uh, Art said, we need something on that wall. Can you paint right on that wall? <laughs> you got to be kidding me. The, the rocks are sticking out like six inches from the border joint. I said, I, I don't think so, Art. <laughs> but we can build you a billboard there. I know how to do that. And uh, so we built stringers on there and put some OSB and, and painted that mandala with the Ukrainian flag behind it. The mandala, the original, is in the gallery. It's about this round, was it four feet across? Uh, stretched it round. I, this is a fun story, Art and I were talking about this earlier. I found a broken uh, picnic table, a uh, patio table, the glass had been broke. And I said, I gotta find a way to stretch a canvas on that. Uh -huh. So I figured it out and then I painted the mandala. And so this was the reproduction of the original. And that's Lindsay right there. Yeah. <laughs> and Nick. <laughs> and Rick. And Art. And anyway, what's the next one? This is the Hot Springs. Greeting from Hot Springs. We, this is a kitchen sink mural. Uh, for, um, uh, Mo, I mean, they kept saying, can you put this on it? Can you put this on it? I think it was the lodger's tax that paid for this on the side of uh, Bullock's. When I showed up, this is T or C. There were gaping holes in the cinder block this big at the bottom for, from 40 years of water dripping uh, down yeah. and splashing back against the wall. <laughs> so I, before I even painted, I had to be a mason and patch all these holes all over this thing to, to get ready to paint. Uh, but that was the lodger's tax that paid for that. And Mo designed it. And if you look at that blend behind there, there's like 12 colors in that blend. That's how you get that transition from that deep blue up there all the way down to the bottom. Can you show the next one, Eduardo? All the way down to the right. That, that's how. That's the only way to get that transition without it looking choppy. You just need lots of colors, and you really have to work it. But that was that was a real special one to do. A little side note. I painted the curb yellow, thinking, well, you know, when you drive down Broadway, you look over there, there's always two or three cars parked right there. 
And there's plenty of parking, so I'm going to paint the curb yellow. Actually, I painted it blue. Nobody, hey, I totally ignored blue. They're like, ah, screw you. Everyone's handicapped, you know? So I said, I'm going to paint it yellow. Well, everybody's grandfathered in. They've been parking there for 25, 30 years, so they don't really, they don't care. They just park right in front of the yellow strip right there. So what's the next one? This is, um, in the movie theater, those are the exit doors on both sides, and John Henry bought that, and we, we put that there. It's nice. I ask people, did you see it? They're going, no, I just walked right out. But it, it's a nice piece in there. Um, and here we are. This is the uh, end of the line, as far as what I've done around here. This is the hummingbird over at the... Uh, Billboard slash mural on is it Matson Street over by the uh, thrift store? Um, right, right over the top of the outer edge. Yeah, uh, just above the outer edge pizza. And coming from the billboard business, you know, I saw this skeleton, this derelict thing, and the panels were all falling off. And so I went hunting, and my path led me to Jagger. Because Jagger used to own that property at one time. He said, I sold it to this guy, and then I chased him around for a couple of months and finally found him. And he said, well, you know, I'm not going to sell it to you, but I'll give you a long-term lease for this, this billboard on the hill. So uh, we cleaned it all up and got it sorted out, disposed of all the old dungeon plywood stuff that was around the base, and put fresh panels on it. And our goal is to change out the bottom, always have something creative, artistic on there. Uh, if we change it enough, then people will want to look at it. It won't become a big, it's just like a freaking stop sign or something. That they'll want to look up there. And then the top, we want to piece out as a sponsor for the mural down below. So that's what we're working on right now. It wasn't going to go away. I didn't want it to be a, a, an ad for a bunch of pot shops or something. Um, which would happen. I thought, let's do something really fun on there and make it an art project, a gift to the town. So that's where we're at. So does anyone have any questions? How do you make the transition from billboards to art? Ooh, that's a good, I'm still doing that. That's, that's tough. It's really, it's, it's hard. Well, my, my goal is once I, once I feel like I'm not, I can't do this anymore, then I think I'll probably do more studio art, but it, at this point, I think I got a couple more good years in me on the side of the building or a billboard. Um, these are some paintings I've done. I, did, I just finished these this week. Um, if, if you're welcome to ask questions about these if you have any. These, this is almost an abstract, but these are paint cups. I pre-mix a lot of these big jobs. And these are the cups that you mix the paint in. But as you get close, I mean, it really is an abstract, and then as you get away, and that's how a billboard is. You know, you're, it's called outdoor advertising. It's not photorealism. You're painting for distance. That's the whole thing with it, you know. If you get too tight, it doesn't look that good on the highway. Um, this here I just finished and stretched. Uh, I, my working title is uh, Friendly Fire. Uh, but my other work, my other title is Art is the opposite of war. And it was just one of those images that kind of came to me in a dream, and I, you know, I had I had this little image of a soldier, and said, I don't, I want to paint the soldier, but how can I also make it an interesting piece that, that has a metaphor to it, you know? And it's up to you to interpret the metaphor any way you want. That's, that's what I came up with. This one here, I'm looking for a title. We have kind of a brain trust here. Um, uh, I started with just a, this is what you can do with paint. This is this is oil-based, uh, fine ground oils. You know, I did the background, I just kind of let it drip down. And then I let all the blue drip down. And, and then I, I knew I was gonna paint Abraham Lincoln, so then I started pulling him out of the drips as best I could. And, and, and sort of creating this, this fun image there and all these little fractals to kind of give it this vibration. How tall is that? Uh, five feet, three by five. 
Free flow. Free flow? Free flow. Free flow. I like it. I like it. I don't know. I, I've done quite a few Abraham Lincoln paintings in my career, so this is something that attracts me to, to the man. Any questions? There is a question here from how did you go from the graphic billboard to the person? Say that again? How did you get from the skill of the graphic billboard image to the person? How did I get there? Yeah. You're self taught, right? Yes. You, like I said, to be a journeyman, you had to learn to paint a portrait. Yeah. You know, they think the black velvet, right? You make it look pretty. <laughs> 480, 70 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're doing those giant, you know, like on the side of a building, are you using like big brushes or what are you using to, you know, do all that? It's a good question. Um, I use everything from 12 inch wallpaper brushes, which you probably see in my studio for big blends. And then a lot of these are just four inch uh, cutters. It, it, it depends. A lot of the big areas, we roll them. And this is a fun story. When I started making billboards in 1973, the union didn't allow rollers. And they had to be done with it. We had these huge six inch mops and oil based paint because they didn't want to take a fast job away. Oh, no, you can't have a roller on that job. Well, in 73, they changed. And that's when we started using rollers. Uh, but we use a little bit of everything, you know, a little, we call them donkey dick rollers. We use nine inch rollers. A, lo uh, a lot of that stuff, the, the pictorial stuff is all done with four inch uh, cutters. When you start out, are you using all oil based paint? It's all oil based paint. Are you still using all oil based paint? Yeah, it's a combination of uh, uh, fine ground oils and alkaline enamels. It's interesting because you can take a tube of uh, oil-based paint, you know, like you see at the art store, and you can squirt that into a quart can. The whole thing, you add linseed oil and mineral spirits, you've got a quart of paint. That's how much paint is in one of those tubes for what I'm doing, the viscosity I'm looking for. You know, this is kind of built up, and you kind of work with more, we call them pures, but on those big wall jobs, you're, you're making paint. Same thing with a lot of the whites. If you're going to do a big blend with white, you, you know, and you want to use um, uh, like lead white or whatever, you add a lot of linseed oil to it so, it so it spreads. But every color in the rainbow, you know, that's the other thing. I mean, you get real good at mixing colors when you do that day in and day out. You constantly, I mean, that's your job. You're mixing colors. And uh, you don't even think about it after a while. You know, you just run in that studio and back in the old days, all the guys used to ask me to mix their colors for them because I was fast and I could nail it pretty quick. And so that was kind of a, a fun thing. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, you said when you started as an apprentice and then eventually they gave you pictorial work mm -hmm. as opposed to what? Lettering. Um, a lot of the guys that I worked with till the day they retired, they never painted a picture. They did lettering. And they were like riggers. They would go out and you know do a lot of the rigging, the backgrounds and all that. But there was a lot of letters in, in the billboard trade, so that was that was there. How did you find your teeth? Um, I think I found them through Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. <laughs> I was looking for a quirky town in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> I looked it up on Google. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, we've been coming down here for about 20 years. A friend of mine moved from, the, uh, from Evergreen to Truth or Consequences via Monticello at first. And then he moved into town and we'd always come down. We'd always look at the real estate market, see what was available. And, one day we saw this house up in the neighborhood and said, whoa, let's go look at that. One thing led to another. It was right when COVID, it was the March when COVID had started. So everybody just shut down and I told the lady that owned the house, I said, let's just wait, we'll, get, we'll work something out. And a couple of months later, we bought the place. 
really, really happy we did. This is this is good. This is as quirky as Evergreen was 34 years ago when I moved there. Evergreen, Colorado was quirky. It's not quirky anymore. It's lost its magic. It's expensive to be there. Uh, people are in a big hurry. Uh, you know, the dynamic has changed. The cowboys have moved away. The hippies are gone. The homeless people, are, they moved them all out. So. How they, how they do that? How'd they do that? Bust them to Denver. So anyway, we're here. here. We love it here. Um, you know, I, I enjoy doing the wall work here and the murals. I, I think it's a golden opportunity. It's a wonderful town. For as small as it is, it has a great, great, great art community. We're, we're really blessed to have this. Not many small towns have this diverse of an art community. Any other questions? Duke, do you have a question? Come on. No. Don't, be Don't be shy. For some photos Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> No questions. You answered all. All right. Yeah, we paint our house. Can you tell us again what the hummingbird is? It's on. Um, you know where the thrift store is on Broadway, going out of town on the right. Okay. If you. Oh. Yeah. If you stand in that parking lot, and look, look north, you'll see. If you, if you park, park it out, or at the pizza, and look up. It's right there. Right. right. Have you ever played in any streets? The street itself, yeah. you know, uh, I, when they had the very first chalk art festival in Denver, Colorado, my friend was the, he was the guy putting it on, because he did all the promotions for Larimer Square, and I said, sure, I'll do one, I'll do a chalk thing. I did it, I couldn't walk for a week <laughs> I mean, you're just on your knees the whole time, just scrubbing this chalk into this rough street. I said, don't ever call me. <laughs> so no, I haven't done that. We've been a few of those jobs, but we, we haven't done that. I'd leave that up to my son. Well, anyway, thanks for coming. I appreciate it.